I have planned two parts. And the first part is about feminist economics approaches and their underlying theories. I have worked a lot um, about heterodox uh, theories, which are very much um, productive for feminist economics, but not entirely productive. I will speak about this uh, in this in in this part. There are and in feminist economics, uh, there exist various approaches and definitions about economics. And I think if you have to know this, because it's a uh, in the public discussion and sometimes it's not so very often it, it's not clear which approach is used by those who speak about feminist economics and then i want to speak also about theoretical and methodological issues next please next and then i want to speak about selected topics i in my former professional life, I worked mainly about the financial sector, and I work a lot with macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic statistics. I see myself as a macroeconomist, and I just uh, want to share with you some of the issues which I think are very important for feminist economics, but are also quite difficult uh, to integrate or to uh, to apply in uh, economic theory, in an extended economic theory. And the one is unpaid work, the elephant in the room. It's always the elephant in the room. You have a lot of literature on feminist aspects, and then you have mentioned uh, the unpaid work, but unpaid work is more then the vol volume of unpaid work in Switzerland is more than all paid work. It's for our time, uh, for the time economy, it's absolute, absolutely central. And then I want to speak about national accounts, time and money as two currencies. And then the question which, with which I personally started, why is it so much, why is, uh, unpaid work so big in our economy it is still so big and how and what will be the future of this work and other work uh, in the care and social provisioning economy. I want to say uh, one thing which I think is important I mean, it's if you do it, this as, let's say, as an activist of the women's strike movement, there you have uh, many questions to raise uh, of which have an economic dimension. You work about it, you look for numbers because all activism and all campaigns look in, or look always for common grounds. If you do, if you uh, do economics as an economist, uh, you look for differences. And I will speak about differences between economic uh, theories, differences also in the interpreta interpretation of, for instance, uh, the connection between capitalism and patriarchy. There are, a lot of controversy um, discussions went on in the 80s, 70s and 80s of last century. They have disappeared a bit, a bit but they reappear in different shape. And I think it's very important to understand uh, the economic theory underlying those differences, but also uh, just know the differences. This does, you can't have any progress in, um, in science if you don't speak about differences. And then I think it's very important. I don't want to, I will mention some names, but I don't want to say that I don't 
I think I think it's not good what they did, but they are on the wrong way of thinking. It's just uh, mentioning that there are very different approaches and interpretation what it means in reality. Next part. Next. Next. We will. I will uh, present part one, and then we will make a break after our discussion. You can ask question and we will have uh, open discussions. After the second part, I just will present the questions. And of course you can dis discuss about everything you know, you, you want to, but I won't be present anymore. I think I like an article about from Susan Himmelweit from 2017. She has written this in, in a very nice book about a pluralist economics. Every heterodox uh, concept is presented and she presented feminist economics. And she says, and I agree fully with her, it's fundamental, it's fundamental premise that e economics needs to take account of gender relations because the differences in men's and women's roles are integral to how any econ e economy runs. I'm half, I, I half agree because the question, where do you speak of roles and where do you speak of different economic functions? Uh, and where do you speak of different uh, situations in which uh, women and men are working. Uh, this is a bit, she, she just says this in very much in general, but this, uh, there is a big difference between different theories. Next. Uh, Susan Himmelweit defines three approaches and definitions of feminist economics. The first one you can read here, feminist economics uh, can be implicitly defined by its politics as economics that focuses on what is needed to create gender equality. A mens mainstream e economist, economist might say, even if one is interested in promoting a more equal society, does one not have the duty to be as objective as possible when studying economics, because for a mainstream economist, politics is not objective. Those who use such a political de definition of feminist economics would argue that mainstream e economics is itself ideological bias based on perpetuating gender inequality by normaliz normalizing men's lives and ignoring much of what women do. I think this is very precise and I'm now 76 years old and uh, I started about 50 years ago. And I started economics about 50 years ago. I still had the privilege of studying plural economics, but no issue of feminist economics was ever treated. I, I was studying, I could uh, make my master about institutional economics. And we had, um, we had also a lot of uh, seminars of students, but much more about Marxism, it's 68 movement and uh, imperialism would be nice to have, it's very necessary to discuss this again. But just to say, for me, as a feminist econo economist, uh, the work as an economist on feminist issues started really about 27 years ago. That's also when in 95, the first uh, professional um, review uh, appeared called Feminist Economics. And and this is from the view of Susan Himmelweit a bit, uh, what developed, what were the fields of activities of practice 
of theory and uh, in, in the last uh, 25, 30 years, Susan Himmelweit is of my uh, generation as well. So I belong to the, this first generation of feminist econo e economists after the, new, the second women's movement. And I think this has been very, very important. A lot of um, women's groups started to work about feminist economics. There were many, many sociologists. They were not so much uh, prevented by economic thinking to think about feminist economics. And the real uh, feminist economics uh, as a profession of professional activity of feminist of economists started as i said 25 years ago but you have plenty 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 of uh, studies mostly micro or meso studies macro economy uh, in those times was not really dis discussed next year. number two yeah susan himmelweit uh, a second point which has from the beginning been very important is feminist economics can equally well be defined by its subject matter as the study of all forms of provisioning by which is meant everything that human beings need to survive and flourish. The use of this notion of provisioning comes from the, the, the recognition that the economy as understood by mainstream economics is a, an incomplete system, one that is dependent for its continued existence on many activities that lie outside its scope. I have worked mainly on this aspect. And the third one, next. Finally, and this is the definition that I will adopt in this chapter, we can define feminist economics methodologically as economics that recognizes that gender relations are a structural characteristic of any economy. That's from uh, China Jita Sen, that's an Indian economist working very early on feminist uh, economics. They are structural in that, in that even if we took a narrow traditional view of the economy as being constituted by market relations alone, changes in the economy can affect gender relations and vice versa. This is in fact a principle you uh, can apply everywhere and which we should apply everywhere. Next, here you see uh, the reference to this article of Susan Himmelweit. I think it's a very, very good article and uh, could be basis for everybody, a, a good uh, starting point for everybody. She has in the second point uh, examples I don't agree with for theoretical issues, but this is not uh, the question today because it would, we could make a seminar on these articles, on, on this article and go on, on on some of aspects of this article but it's great it's a very good to read i think it should exist in german and then i would like to refer to women's budget group in england in london it was um i, I think susan himmelweit was one of the founders of this group they started, I think, on the beginning of the 90s. And if you want to know uh, about more about the productivity, about uh, what you can do with this approach, look at this uh, website because it's really very, very impressive what meanwhile, meanwhile they have done in 20 years. We started with women budgets also in Switzerland uh, in 96, but we did never had money to continue it. We had quite some 
um, initiatives on the town, uh, canton and uh, church levels. But uh, the problem is we really didn't have the money. The women's budget group, they managed to be uh, to ask the government that for every year the budget of the national government, or I think the British, British uh, the national government, they had to pay to this uh, to this organ to this group uh, for an ana analysis from a feminist point of view. We are far away in Switzerland of such uh, financing. And there was also another issue, a very close uh, cooperation between university, universities or professors of universities with uh, feminist civil society groups. Um, Susan Himmelweit herself was a, um, a professor of the I think People's University, uh, Diane Ellison, one of the grand old women, she also participated from the beginning. I just want to say that you have, you can rely now as young students, you can rely now on very rich material. You don't have to find out everything uh, yourself, but there is a lot of work to do in respect to theory, to analysis, to research, and so on. Now the next. De facto, I think from the theoretical point of view of a theoretical background, uh, there are two approaches, gender and economics and social provisioning. I will, uh, I think if you start the first one, you ask very a lot about differences the invisibility of women and differences between men and women about wages, wage, uh, uh, about the gender wage gap, about uh, which is still quite, uh, quite big in Switzerland, mainly for older women of 50 years old and more. Uh, there, Switzerland has very bad. Uh, has is is always it's more than twenty five or up to thirty percent of of the uh, the wage gap is more than twenty five percent. It's a hell of a lot for older women. You ask those questions. You can also ask a lot of questions about gender mainstreaming, uh, for instance, in government uh, projects, uh, government budgets and so on. I think it's a very interesting uh, analytical instrument just to always ask for data as well. I just want to mention during um, COVID-19, uh, our government has, um, has paid billions of francs to people who had to stop to work or couldn't work full time. But they didn't have, they don't have a statistics about how much the men got, uh, how much was dedicated for jobs of men and how much was dedicated for jobs of women. A very simple statistically and also from the administrative point of view, a very simple question. And when asked, I was on a meeting about statistics, when asked the uh, the the man from the SECO, uh, he said, oh, we thought it was too complicated. Uh, we are, you really must know that we are very much uh, uh, backward in those issues of gender mainstreaming. Just very mainstream gender mainstreaming doesn't exist. The European uh, community has a law that if big projects are planned, always you have also uh, to ask gender mainstreaming questions. They have left it out now for this next generation budget. They said it's, we couldn't do it because we had to decide very fast about it. Just to say there has been 20, 30 years of fight just for a, 
a relative simply and very mainstream economic near gender mainstreaming but even this is very difficult still to achieve in switzerland social provisioning is a total different is a, not, not totally but a very different approach it speaks about an economic sector where in the case of, of switzerland 80 percent of the volume of paid and unpaid work of of women is done in this sector, social provisioning. I will, I will explain afterwards how it is defined. And you speak about an economic sector, like about industry or about finance sector. And it's, I think it's more or less the consent that this sector is different compared to industry. So you, in, in respect to labor processes, um, processes of decision, processes of exchange. I will explain a bit more. And so you speak about the sector, you don't say men, women, you, this, you always say, but you say, what is the impact on the care or social provisioning economy? And this is a different question and underlying to this question is a different concept of uh, what 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 economy is about and this has been discussed uh, during the whole 20th century uh, there's a, a very nice article for, from Karl Polanyi who says we speak about efficiency of scarcity and so on and others speak about producing the uh, the material means to live and producing the material conditions for accumulation of capital, which is something very different. So there is, is a new discussion about this sector, very vacuum, and I myself tried uh, to quantify it, how much it is for Switzerland. I will show you afterwards next. So uh, the gender and economics as, as a principle, no economic analysis without asking about gender relations and data. And I think this has to be, you still belong to the generation who has really to campaign that this is realized at universities and mainly also in the state or in banks or anywhere. Inequality between men and women and the related gender roles uh, is, is very important, as you have seen uh, with the citation of uh, Himmelweit. And one of the main issues is the critique of the rash, uh, rationalistic view of man. This is really the topic during uh, since uh, the 80s and 90s of last century. In uh, the view of man in neoclassical economics is a key point which has been totally deconstructed by feminist economists. And then a very important issue is gender pay gap, gender budgeting, etc. And uh, in 2017, the Eurostat, uh, published another indicator of the gender pay gap, which is uh, the gender overall, overall earnings gap, where all earnings of women and men are, um, are accounted, and then the difference between men and women. The difference in Switzerland is 44 0.5%, and this is due to the gender pay gap, to uh, less, to less uh, employment, to a lower employment, and to uh, less working hours per, uh, per uh, month. This is new, and Switzerland and Germany and Austria are really on the top of the list, and the Netherlands as well, and UK, and uh, if you were in Sweden and if 
if you would took uh, the data from Sweden, uh, Sweden and apply them for Swiss GDP, Swiss compensation statistics, it would be uh, for Swiss, Switzerland, it is the compensation difference between men and women, including uh, the insurances, the social insurance insurances linked to the compensations. Uh, it's more than a hundred billion uh, Swiss francs. Sweden would be a trans, if, if you would apply the Swedish data, it would be in Switzerland about 50 billion francs, still a lot, but at least much better. And a hundred billion Swiss francs difference of income by, compens by, by salaries, uh, has, this has a, a big impact on, on old age insurance. But the other thing is, it's just huge. If you look at the tax income of companies by the, of, of the state in total, uh, in all states, canton, communities, and, and the central state, the federal state, it's only 22 billion Swiss francs compared to a difference of income of women of 100 billion. It's enormous. And I'm still thinking a lot about and discussing with uh, fellow economists, how can you make this, uh, uh, this very large gap uh, smaller? It's huge. It's really a macroeconomic issue. And uh, this you all can, uh, with the with principle of Himmelweit, you can uh, calculate this. And you, you don't need other theoretical uh, approaches. The starting point for gender, I already said, it's a starting point for gender mainstreaming. It's very imp important for budget gender budgets, and there is one point, uh, Amartya Sen, he has developed outlet of, a, let's say, a reduced, modified mainstream economy, the capability approach. This capability approach is very individual. It's very near to a new feminist view of human capital. And um, I just say uh, this approach is very good for those, for, for those uh, three aspects. Next. We come to the social provisioning approach. Provisioning activities which take place in a variety of sites, such as the household and the labor market, and through a variety of social relations, such as kinship, market exchange, and citizenship, enable well-being. Incomes are generated not only by wage labor, self-employment, and asset ownership, but also by entitlements for the state from the state through citizenship or residency and the community. If you, I think it's very important, and this is the real contribution. I think a new theoretical contribution of feminist economics. Remember, uh, Keynes made a very, two very important contributions uh, compared to Marx, for instance, or compared to mainstream, not uh, uh, to the main, to neoclassical uh, economics. Keynes really uh, formulated a, the a theory of the financial, financial sector, which goes beyond to what Marx discussed well in the 19th century. And this, in my opinion, this a social provisioning approach is really the new contribution of feminist e economics. E economics. If you look at uh, gender and economics, one problem is that you it's not possible to explain what is really, why those uh, gender relations exist. Uh, 
the social provisioning approach uh, is uh, has the thesis that a very big part of uh, gender relations is uh, shaped by by this social provisioning uh, sector and uh, and for this and, and a lot has been worked about this next please here you have i was very, really really happy to see this book the rootledge handbook of feminist economics and it's a handbook on feminist economics where they speak mainly about this uh, this social provisioning approach. It's very expensive. You ask it at a university library, but I have looked it through very quickly. I have, you can read directly on books, Google, uh, the introduction, and it's you have a condensated, uh, a condensated uh, book about what has been thought about and worked about and analyzed in the last 25, 30, sec uh, 30 years. Because uh, feminist economics, with exception of uh, the review, it's very uh, tiring to have an overview. You, you, there are so many things written, and but this is really, um, I'm really happy, and I said to my colleagues at Economy Feminist, uh, I said, now you take this book and you, you really can see what's about, what has been researched and discussed in the last 25, 30 years. So uh, if, you start, if you really want, uh, in, are interested in feminist economics, uh, you really can rely very much on this, the first uh, article of Himmelweit, which is short and very clear, and this Rutledge handbook, you, uh, it's great that you have too many, many issues. Uh, you have an overview of what has been discussed and who is who and so on. Next. Social provisioning approach uh, has, the following questions. How are production and services, work and income organized in a society which on the one hand enables life survival and survival, and on the other hand, the accumulation of capital, of capital? And there is a close connection to gender relations as a structural uh, reality of the whole society, I think, this is a this is a is another uh, this is than Himmelweit. Himmelweit doesn't uh, say anything about has doesn't have or present the theory of why uh, gender relations are a structural always a structural issue uh, in uh, for gender relations. And, the, and this theory, theory says, and this is very Marxist in the approach about uh, production for, uh, for living and uh, And it's also very institutional. It's, it was always clear that uh, there is not just work done in market relations, uh, in industry that there are various forms of uh, production, uh, forms of production, forms of domination, forms of exploitation, uh, and not only the market economy or the capitalist economy. This is very important. And I think it's a principle you can start with, but the problem is for me, that I think um, how those different forms of donations and ex exploitations have changed during my lifetime. And what is actually, what is currently um, the case, I don't know. 
I ha didn't have the time to write down uh, the title. Uh, Nancy Folbre, one of the very famous feminist, US feminist economists, my generation as, as well. She has now edited a book, I think it was in 2020, about patriarchy and link to capitalism. There is a very old and very long discussion and she tries as an economist uh, to put together also how, how do you think the whole thing? And uh, I th this book is worth reading. I have started to read it, but I was too long uh, in hospital, didn't have time. But this would be a book, book, I think, very valuable to read in groups if there is any group who work about who want to, wants to work about this issue. And we will come, we will uh, we will discuss this later on. And then very basic is industrial production of goods has a different economic logic than person and household related services. And this is the argumentation why you should have a different, think about a different economic sector. Banks are not, not the same as the financial sector, isn't it? Not the same as the capital industrial sector, the state is not the same, households are not the same, and so on. And it's just, it's very, this is one of the basic issues. What is different is discussed, um, not, there is a very va various uh, argumentation, what is different worth uh, analyzing uh, but we don't have the time to do it, and I'm not able to give a really a solid overview. Of this uh, economic debate and analysis, ec economics of human rights has, uh, has, has uh, a very close link to this approach, and uh, it's because it's about livelihood, producing livelihood, and and uh, and I understand that power, one of the Marilyn Power, one of the first who who speaks that a big part of feminist economics is about social provisioning. Uh, she is now working on this economics of human rights, but this you will find also in the handbook. Next. Now I come to one point as a background economist. For me, mainstream economists and also feminist methodological individualism doesn't, is, is a no-go. Um, and you have this methodological individualism also in the old Keynesian economic theory, in the new Keynesian economy, for instance, of Krugman, Paul Krugman. And this is one of the largest and most important differences between post Keynesianism and uh, the traditional Keynesianism. Not the only one, the other one is. is uh, monetary theory and the other one, the third one is that they have really developed much further the theory of purchasing power and uh, equality and inequality. The next, and for me as a feminist macroeconomics and for the whole, let's say, uh, uh, not all, no, for uh, the post-Keynesian, post-Marxist and uh, institutional e e economics, it's important to distinguish uh, social groups and or economic aggregates in, in analysis and to start with this. And what I propose is that you st really start with social provisioning because women is are in so many different uh, economic situations and have so many different uh, social functions 
that you can't make just men, women as, you can't make an aggregate of women. But what you can do is really uh, take a, a, a social provisioning as an economic sector, whatever it is. And then um, you have in Switzerland, uh, according to my calculations, it's about 80% of the volume of paid and done paid work of women. So you, sp you really speak about very important uh, situations of women. And what is clear, uh, this is also the op opinion of uh, Susan Himmelweit, of, I, I think of everybody who works on feminist economics, is that social provisioning, maintenance of human beings is in all theories of feminist economics part of theory. And also a different economic logic. But I think the big difference is how you speak, how you think about the whole. Do you think of this as a sector? Do you uh, really make macroeconomic analysis started with, with macroeconomics and mesoeconomics and not starting with uh, microeconomics as you do in, in, in neoclassical and also in traditional Keynesian anal analysis. Next. I have talked about this because I think you will be Economists, I wouldn't tell this, um, let's say, sociologists or insist on this so much with sociologists. It is just important to know what we are doing as economists and why we are choosing what me methods and approaches. And you have, if you, yes, and uh, feminist economic theory usually draws on, modifies very much and develops three traditions of thought, Keynesian post-Keynesianism. This is uh, institutional economics and Marxist post-Marxist e e economics. And I really want to insist on the fact that feminist economics is plural, very plural in practice of research and theory. It's not only the pluralism of different theories, but it's really very plural in practice of research and theory. I don't think that post-Keynesianism has a, a certain method, a certain uh, relies on a certain basic theories, uh, as well as the Austrian, which, uh, which are very strange, and uh, Marxist theories, uh, it's, it's just, uh, Feminists have been inspired by many approaches and tried and used some approaches and then dropped them. And I did it in the same way. I looked at theories and had a question and said, who could provide a way of thinking about it, of existing theories? Next. Here I come to the question of capitalism, patriarchy, and accumulation. There was a big demonstration in Paris in 81, and there were two, the, uh, the cortege, the uh, demonstrators were separated in two big groups. One is we march against patriarchy, and the other we march against capitalism. And this uh, controversy never has been resolved. And there is one very, very interesting French uh, theoretician who is one of the very influential feminist uh, theoretician of the autonomous feminist movement, who has written a book about, uh, I think it's uh, households. So, I don't, uh, I, her name is Christine Delphi. I didn't have the time to look up uh, the title. And she has written uh, one 
English speaking uh, book has been published by her, her and she has a very, very interesting chapter uh, written a, a critique on Marxist feminism, which is really, really worth reading. What you see here is on the left, all which belongs to economy except person uh, related uh, services. This is uh, agriculture industry and a reduced sector of services, which is uh, all services for industry, for banks and so on, is uh, very uh, reduced uh, are, are in it. And you see the in blue, the compensations, the monetary, uh, the compensation or the mo monetary value of unpaid work. And you see there you have the yellow one, could, you could call this value added in the Marxist sense. It's all which is, uh, the total is value added and the, the rest is what is part of appropriation by non-workers. This is a, a Marxist view. In, and, and, the, and then you have the green line and then you have social provisioning. I will explain it uh, in the second part what I, I statistically, I, I can, I, I'm just joining to in, just putting into the sector uh, social provisioning. You see uh, the work done in the paid, the paid work done in this social provisioning sector itself, education, and, but it's also retail trade and so on. You see that uh, the margin of profit or uh, which can be uh, appropriated is much, much smaller in, with respect to the, the salaries. And then you have the unpaid work. Uh, you have the statistics, we have very, very good statistics on mainly for macroeconomic use uh, about unpaid work and uh, how much, what's the value? And you say, you see it's enormous, the value. And then they, they have calculated a third of value added at the end. And now the problem is, the theoretical pro problem is, and the controversy problem is, how do they link together? What's the link between this uh, left from the green and right from the green sectors. And uh, Federici, Silvia Federici, she is, she is convinced that if you pay this work uh, of unpaid work is paid with very low compensations, by the way. If this, if you pay this very huge uh, sector of unpaid work, this will diminish the accumulation of capital. That's why capitalists don't have um, an interest that ever so much unpaid work ever will be paid. So I don't agree with her. I think it would be possible. I think Sweden also shows that part of it is possible. Sweden is a very um, successful, capitalist uh, country. And there is another um, theory, which is more uh, Folbre, but I, I must say, admit that I haven't have, have the time to really precisely read uh, this book. Uh, she says that the dom forms of domination and uh, exploitation, uh, the domination prepares the people in the social, uh, prepares the people like patriarchy, the family and so on, prepares the people to be exploited by capitalists. And there is a third position, which is mine, which is a very much French position. We speak of articulation of mode of production. And this notion comes from, from the first uh, critical analysis of the economies of 
uh, former colonies of France, and they speak of different modes, modes of production. And uh, you have Folbre um, doesn't doesn't like this notion. She doesn't. Uh, she doesn't. Um, she's very skeptical, but I'm not because it's very open and it really leaves the room also for historic uh, research that to think always about uh, new connections between the different sectors. This is uh, what I want to say. And if you want to discuss about this, um, well, it's OK. We can do it. Next. So what we need to know more about the economic sector. I have worked now more or less systematically about this sector during uh, 10 years. I have worked mainly if you take branches out of this sector about the health uh, system. And, uh, but a lot has to be done. And I must say, we have still, we have a lot of data that we still can do a lot of things and what has to be done is really have a much better knowledge of this sector of the work done conditions of work and uh, how it is financed as uh, the role of the state and so on we have to know more about political and social economy of care and social provisioning care is part of social provisioning and formally in the beginning of the 80s, care was used in England mainly as the whole, as an identical with social provisioning. Social provisioning is more uh, a US American notion, but care now is much more uh, limited to direct care, care for children, care for uh, uh, elderly people, care for people who are ill. And so I first always used in my articles care, and I now speak of social provision, or in German as Sorge uh, und Versorgungswirtschaft. In French, we have now agreed, now I must try to remember, on the notion et soin et service à la personne, aux, aux personnes. Haben, nennen wir es jetzt. Es ist schwierig, auf Französisch zu übersetzen. Und ich habe schon viel diskutiert mit Französischsprachigen. Also wer von euch Französisch spricht, uh, who speaks uh, French, uh, it's very, uh, we have a lot of difficulties in translation. We are very much uh, influenced now by uh, English. Uh, by Anglo-Saxon analysis and traditions of thinking. And I regret very much uh, that the French uh, traditions have disappeared a bit. And also from my view, I don't have any more time to read those things. But Switzerland would be good to have those common, uh, to look at what in France, which has been very interesting from a theory point of view, feminist theory point of view uh, and and compare with Italy and com compare with uh, German speaking conditions. And then the second point, which is the real big macroeconomic challenge is to understand the dynamics of this social provisioning sector in connection with other sectors and the industries. And then the third one I won't speak about, um, we have worked a lot in a group in economic feminist and before the dynamics of money circulation. How does the monetary production work? The role of public finance in, in the social, how, how does the monetary production work in the social in provisioning sector? The role of public finance and other collective financial institutions. Oh, there is an institute. Is a, is a mistake. So uh, this is, I'm working on this. We are working in a group of feminist economic, economics about this, about public finance. 
you have a total in the structure of financing the care economy, you have a total end of pipe uh, system that uh, the more care, the more it's uh, the responsibility of fin financing by communities and so on. They're very interesting, very complex, and we are working on this. And who wants to join, you're very welcome uh, to do it. Next, please. I just finish the parts I, I, the two parts with ecological issues. If you work about, if you have the approach gender and economics, the impact analysis of any policy, policies on gender relations and inequality between men and women uh, is possible and necessary. And this is also true for any in environmental policy. If you have a social provisioning approach, uh, the social provisioning system uh, sector can be considered as an economic sector like industry banks. And you have to make the same analysis from an ecological point of view. Households, and this is the most important uh, point in this concept are a producing and not just consuming sector. You will come to very different results if you look at consumption of energy, uh, of consumption of energy uh, ca calculated as percentage of GDP, for instance, or compared to GD GDP, you will arrive to very different indicators. And usually this is not done. And there is a real big problem that work done by people disappeared in main mainstream economics. You speak only about outcomes, which is important, and about consumption. But if you integrate work in the whole discussion and the work of women as well, and spe especially then you will have a very different discussion compared to the first one, to the gender and economics approach. The gender and economics approach can be integrated in the, the social provisioning approach, but it's more a perspective how you look at, at the economy in respect of, uh, with respect of ecological issues. I just want to mention one point, and I honestly don't know yet what to think about. If you look at the value of unpaid work done by women and men to produce meals at home in your household, you can look this up in, in, our, in the Swiss uh, statistics. It's the double of what uh, people pay for um, consumed for the con for buying uh, food and non-alcoholic uh, alcoholic beverages. The double the value of the work unpaid done at home to prepare me meals. We have also uh, unpaid work and shopping for shopping. Com you can compare this. All those uh, those categories which are. You, you can look at in detail at, in the statistics, uh, you, un, unpaid work for shopping compared to paid work in shopping centers. You understand much more about dynamics of this link between the two types of work. After all, we need jobs, we need shopping, and we need use. We, we after which we have to use uh, what we shop at home. And uh, there is a lot of things we, we could do. Also from, from the ecological point of view, livelihood is a central concept. And for this, it's really mainly also in the whole global, uh, in the whole feminist or women's networks of the global south 
this livelihood is a very important concept and it's a very economic concept. It's about person on, and household related paid and unpaid services of a different economic logic I have shortly explained. And there is the question, who does it and who has access to social provisioning? Uh, you can have um, small uh, peasants, women, peasant women or men, and they produce it, what we consume, but they don't get the money to, uh, to buy what they produce themselves. We have more and more this, this uh, development and we have, have to, uh, there are a lot of analysis about that, but it's just a, another holistic approach, not for the whole economy, but for this sector. And just numbers. The social provisioning sector, in my calculation, is 70% of paid and unpaid work of men and women. And the household sector alone uh, has, a, has a value added of 41% of GDP. In the normal uh, national accounts, it's about 2% or something like this. There are questions. Yeah, so my question was on the part where you said that um, this idea of integrating care work into the economy, uh, like uh, unpaid care work, sorry, and um, where you said that um, Silvio Friderici um, has the opinion that if you would do that, like the, that, that that's actually not possible in a capitalist economy, if I understood you correctly. And you said you disagree with that opinion. And I, I was wondering if you could maybe a bit elaborate on why. Well, one thing is integrated in our economic thinking in order to understand dynamics. And the other question is what to do about it and what is, what is possible in capitalism. And I think, um, I think capitalists, uh, it's the question behind the whole thing is how you perceive um, accumulation, capitalist accumulation. There are two questions. I will show you afterwards that the largest part of accumulation in a traditional Marxist way is really made in um, is really made in the in industrial in, in the non-social provisioning sector. And now you have a new development that you have a, 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 an enormous accumulation in the rent. Um, rent economy is a famous one percent who get richer and uh, who control more and more of economic resources and the second point is discussed very in a very interesting way uh, by the uh, some of the monetary and uh, new modern monetary theories and by Marxists but the other point is, I don't, I don't think it's helpful to say that uh, the social provisioning sector is, is for capitalism very attractive for accumulation. It always has existed and it always has provided very little for accumulation. This I will show in, in a chart uh, in, in the second part. And for this, I really, really plead uh, to economists that uh, really we analyze uh, those relationships and, um, and also, in fact, it's also a question of interest. There has been a discussion of a US uh, Marxist economist a high, feminist economist Heidi Hartmann, and she said we have really to be to find out who profits from this big uh, big division of work between uh, of work and also a big division between uh, markets and the rest of production. Uh, uh, units which were uh, who, which have very little uh, connections with uh, Mar Marxist accumulation and Marxist uh, value valuation. 
capitalist valuation. And she said there, in fact, we should talk about three interest groups, uh, capitalists, then uh, men or, or society or privileged classes of society. And I think when I was 25, let's say, uh, this was very different to what, how it is now. But I fear we don't have enough in analysis. I would love to, uh, to uh, if such an analysis would be made. So the chances for, for working groups within fem economists, feminist e e economists is, uh, there are many, many themes we could analyze and we still, for unpaid work and value of unpaid work, GDP, extended GDP, we have the data since uh, 97, more than 20 years, 25 years nearly. So there is a lot of possibilities to work also about tendencies. I think I have quite a good formation in Marxism because I have taught it in Mozambique. Uh, and I have always had a lot of, of controversial discussions. I think also that, that there in the analysis about uh, um, of capital accumulation in our days uh, is, can, is very controversial. And there is underlying always one problem, which is Marx has been a specialist. He has never, um, in fact, his focus was accumulation of economic power and not exploitation as such. And I think there is a group, uh, Capital as Power, who says that today the accumulation of power, uh, capitalist power is always money, is always financial assets, uh, that this functions in a very different way. And they have a sort of 1% uh, theory. I just read it with interest. And I, when I discussed with Celia Federici, I just felt very much that it's uh, this view what is, is capitalist accumulation uh, is different between her and me. And uh, I think also Folgre has a different opinion. And I will certainly read this book uh, in very much in detail. Uh, Federici also has published a book about uh, uh, what is um, primitive accumulation and and uh, and uh, and gender or something like this, and I think those books are very interested because both uh, think about also Marxism. I think Folbre comes very much from a classical institutional background in the United States, uh, which has always been some way the critical theory. Not the, not the Marxist theory like in Europe. And but she knows a lot about Marxism. I think she comes from the left. And in her new book about patriarchy and rise and fall of patriarchy and how do we think the whole thing, also diversity and so on. Uh, I think she reflects very much, uh, it's a reflection of an old uh, woman of an old economist who has really thought about it and thought about uh, those theories uh, during her professional lifetime. So I just uh, say that I have a different position because I have a different view on what is capitalist accumulation and what it's, is the interest of capitalists in, in those days. And this has also uh, influence for me on my view uh, of a basic income, I have been a big, uh, I, I was very much in favor of basic income in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. 
until I started, uh, I have started to work very much more um, systematically about macroeconomics. And if you speak about macroeconomics, you also have to think about capitalist uh, accumulation, which is very important in those days. If any group wants to work about this and think about this and read about this, I'm very much um, ready to sustain this work. And because I think it, it interests me personally very much. It's okay, this answer. Yes, thank you. Is it on mute? No. Oh. Yeah, thanks very much. You want to discuss uh, other points of the first part, or sh should we uh, go to the second part? Yeah, I think we can go on to the second part. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, second part. I have just selected topics, and I always, uh, my big, uh, I, I like very much to work with statistics, and I just uh, try to sort out statistics from a feminist point of view and combine them in a new way. So I will show you some of the things. Could you, please, next please. Next. We're just having some, um, some technical difficulties. We're just trying. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay. I already said unpaid work to integrate in economic thought is really complicated. And it's always, you can read the very progressive books, very uh, heterodox, very, and they call themselves even with feminist implications and so on. But the dimension of unpaid work and it's very limited concept of work uh, is really the, is never really considered. If you have really half, uh, if, if you have really more than half of the work, uh, unpaid work done, uh, done unpaid, you, if you are an economist, you cannot avoid to think about it. It's not just a branch you are thinking about, like, uh, let's say the, um, the machine branch or ph pharmaceutical branch, it's much larger, it's as large, if you look at work done, uh, it, it's as large as, as uh, the whole, what we usually call economy. And if you, cal if you calculate in terms of extended GDP, you add, the value added of a brutto Wertschöpfung in German, the value added uh, to the GDP, conventional GDP, you have the extended GDP. Uh, the, uh, the, what's the, the Office of Statistics of Switzerland presents all those calculations. You, you don't have to do it yourself. And they calculate to value the unpaid work they calculate the labor costs per hour, uh, compare, they compare the labor costs of an hour for similar uh, paid work in the market. And it's very low. And what they, um, in, in their, in, in their um, statistics, what they uh, define as work, unpaid work is work which everybody could do. That means, uh, for instance, in, in crashes in, or work done for children and so on, it's only this type of work. And a lot of work, uh, for instance, if you work in a, if you cook, uh, prepare meals in a, in a kitchen and you have small children playing in the kitchen, you know very well that you don't prepare the meals as, as quickly as usually. And all this counted is not counted. Also the, that you have to get up at night 
and because uh, the child awakes and doesn't want to sleep anymore and so on, all those things and to telling stories at night and is not calculated. And uh, it's even so, it's for the time you need to do this unpaid work also for as a whole, for, for yourself, for your partner, for everybody who works, uh, who lives in a household, uh, it's, it's just huge. And I calculated for raising children, it's about 25, uh, 20, uh, raising children and care for, elder pe uh, for ill people, for uh, who can't do this work themselves, it's about 20, 20 to 25%. The rest is all unpaid work for ourselves, for uh, adult, able-bodied persons. So I think we have to think more about it. Uh, there are different views in Marxist economy. It's just reproduction that uh, capitalists have workforce, but it's much more. It's producing standard of living and how you think about it in the old fashioned way of thinking about it in the United States, they have old numbers. They have numbers start uh, sometimes for the beginning with the 1920s. Uh, it's they, they look at the unpaid work as consuming, as work of consuming after all, if you buy a washing, machine you have to use it otherwise it's not worthwhile buying it you have mainly this discussion and much less care work but if you have read my article you see that the ultra neoliberal uh, Gary uh, S. Beckel he speaks he, he says it's part of producing standard of living and half of it is not paid but he sees it in a neoclassical context, it's just the household is a unit as the uh, as the single uh, as a business or a bank or or the state, a community, and so on. And you don't care how this why uh, this is uh, it's it's so much. You don't care. Uh, he's just saying, let's be honest. It's a hell of a lot and the dis distribution is like this because it's rational women are able to do it better at home than men and for this they develop a division of work uh, and so on and this has uh, been rightly criticized but i must say at least this ultra neoliberal man has uh, mentioned has has seen this and has formulated this already 20, 30, 30 years ago. In Switzerland, uh, to, uh, to speak of stand, produce, producing standard of living in the household, it's far away. And in some way, the use of care as the notion is too much linked to the relationship we have personally uh, to the person. Uh, cared for than uh, to the economic aspect aspect that it's hours and hours and hours of work. And then if you look at the extended GDP, GDP households is 41% of the whole uh, extended GDP, non-financial corporations and or institutions like cooperatives as well is 46.8. And banks insurance is 5.5% 5, 5 general government, 6.3% uh, and other 0.7%. Uh, so we just see if you think in GDP, in money and not in hours, you see that it's just enormous. And we don't have nor a history, nor a theory of a, a, a theory of this sector, uh, though it's half, it's really enormous in our economy still, 
in Switzerland. I have studied uh, development uh, in those time. It's not development economics, economics of developing countries. And it was normal to speak about uh, uh, women, uh, uh, about women's unpaid work and a lot of men's small peasant work. And I thought it would be, when I first saw the numbers, I thought it would be much less in Switzerland, but it still is huge. Next. It's a challenge, as I said, for heterodox economics as well. This is really uh, the one, uh, the second issue, the time and money connection uh, in feminist economics. And the other one is uh, the definition of a sector uh, called social provisioning. And how to include unpaid work in economic ana analysis. We have very good data, I said, for macroeconomic analysis. And in fact, you always have to do both things. You look at, uh, you look at data about unpaid work, and you look in all sectors of the economy, you have them. Uh, it's called AVOL, uh, labor force statistics. You have all those data. And you look at those data on unpaid work, which appears every three to four years and are an extended, uh, uh, are an extended, uh, how do you say, uh, Erhebung in English, uh, extended way, uh, extended research of the of the statistic of uh, about workforce in Switzerland and. In other countries, uh, they make a special. Uh, uh, they make a special research on time budgets, but we only have a research uh, about certain activities in households. How and they ask how, um, how many hours, uh, how many minutes did you spend on washing, uh, on on washing your dishes and so on, on preparing your meals. On and so on, and then you get this, and it's linked to all other data of uh, the workforce statistics. Okay, and so we can really uh, compare the landscape. I would call uh, of the map of work done in Switzerland, paid and unpaid, and how to analyze gender relations in economics. A lot is done, of course, with gender pay gap, with this gender overall earnings gap, which is really impressive, and, uh, and so on, and different work people, men and women do. And even if you agree, and I agree, that men and women shouldn't differ, uh, there shouldn't be a, a big segregation, segregation of the uh, labor market it exists and you even see in the st statistics about unpaid work that you have big differences in the unpaid work men and women do it's not only that women do much much more unpaid work but that they do uh, different the if you compare uh, the the percentage of work done by men and women unpaid you see they there is a big variability. And this, for me, is the main argument for gender mainstreaming, because any measure of policy always have, has very different uh, influences on different uh, act, uh, economic activities. And as, it's so, uh, as there are so big differences, between men and women, you always have to look at gender relations. And how to include paid care work as part of all care work uh, or of social provisioning, I should write. Um, I, I will show afterwards with charts I have made. And 
Marilyn said feminist economics is that we don't have only to calculate in, in money, income, as you all, you all economics is about resulting money flows. And, but we also have to, uh, to think, uh, to really calculate in time. And there is a seemingly very trivial fact that we all have only 24 hours per day. And this is a fundamental principle of the ideas about equality of pay. It always has been a very, of the whole worker movement, this question of time and money always has been a very important issue. And it is very, very important also from the feminist point of view, we just include unpaid work. Next. My initial economic questions at the beginning of the 80s was when I saw the first numbers for uh, Euro European countries about unpaid and paid work. Uh, I was really shocked because I, I, I asked myself, why has it taken so long for me as an economist to have a realistic idea about the scale of unpaid work on the scale of care work in European countries. If I look at statistics, uh, I always try to think, what do I expect, expect? And if the expectation differs enormously of, of what I see, then I can start to ask questions. And uh, I started with this question because my imagination was really the men's case, average men's case, that two thirds of, uh, of total work volume is paid work and one third is unpaid work. And it never, has, it never has been like this for women. And the average is 50-50 more or less today. And I ask myself, why has my imagination been so male biased? Because, because I have studied economics, I, yes, I, I was a very already quite qualified economist with a lot of work experience, research experience, and I still had this imagination uh, in the 80s. And today I must say that my imagination has been so male biased because I have studied economics. It, I think there is, yeah, uh, well, medicine is also terribly male biased, but it's really economics, it's really male biased, and it's very difficult to get out of this bias. Uh, then uh, the next question was how to analyze macro macroeconomic dynamics, including paid work. What are the future tendencies? How to achieve gender equality? And how will labor intensive work be financed in the future? These were uh, the questions I have worked about in the last few years. Now we continue with, please. Next. Why is it so much, still so much? When I studied uh, ec economics of developing countries, the assumption always was that uh, the unpaid work and the whole informal work, very badly paid with very low, in very low income and so on, will disappear and progress will be more and more regulated work, reg reg uh, regularly paid work. And this was also the imagination of in socialist countries. And it was the Im imagination of the left in the United States, but it didn't happen. It's still a hell of a lot. And the amount didn't change so much. So much maybe, or not only maybe, uh, surely what is done unpaid and badly paid, what is done in social provisioning, it's, uh, the, uh, it's different to what has been done when I was 20 or when my mother was 20. 
And the question is, why it's so, is it so much? And I think there are, I just have uh, made a list of um, argumentations, explanations, which I saw somewhere in, in the literature. And one, the main, uh, uh, very important for the left feminist movement is interplay of capitalist and patriarchal exploitation and domination. As I said before, it's not so clear uh, what, how this interplay functions, and there are the controversies about it. But it's worth uh, thinking about this and analyzing it much more. And then the second point, which is very important and produced also a very important part of the first ecological uh, economic theory by uh, institutional e economist, uh, Carl William, William Cobb, who was my professor. His articles are still very, not for feminists, but in general are very, very good. And it's the uh, concept that capitalists, that competition works because capitalists, works mainly because capitalists can outsource a cost and not because capitalists are especially uh, are uh, pr producing better and cheaper. That's very important. And, and uh, this is one of the basic assumptions in, uh, in, in the, oh, I'm, I'm getting tired in, in the in, institutional economic theory. And they speak about externalization of ecological and social costs. It's the outsourcing of complexity. And I have, um, I have learned a, a lot uh, uh, about it when I worked about the health economy. It's the regulation, which are political decisions, not decisions of capitalists, really is such that it's standardizing everything, every minute people are working, even doctors are working. And it's the complexity of, of uh, nursing, of uh, medical treatment and so on is just standardized than that it's uh, total, its complexity is totally disappears. And usually you are confronted with it as a patient and but all who work in, in the hospitals and uh, feel that they cannot work, cannot do their work anymore as they wished. And I think it's a very, very important issue. And uh, you don't have this uh, progress, technological progress, machines and so on, without standardization. You, the state functions, if you look at all regulation, you always have to standardize. Free market is very much standardized, standardized uh, and standardization itself is very interest linked. And so I think it's a very important issue, uh, the externalization of costs and uh, connected to the complexity of reality. And also uh, Steve Keen, who comes from uh, modern monetary theory, he says he had uh, developed um, mathematical uh, models to model complexity of uh, the economic system, the complexity of uh, money flows and so on. And he says we need another mathematics in order to really represent in a, in a useful way what happens really economically. He really mocks this. He's very angry about the primitive math mathematics used in economics. Then the blue one is what I have worked about. The labor productivity question I have showed to you 
to, to you, no investment if it's not worth it. If you have such a high, such, such a high percentage of labor costs and such a little yellow margin of profitability, then you don't, as a cap, good capitalist, you don't uh, invest. And even if you're a cooperative, you have to accumulate in order to, for, in, in order to renew the, the production process and so on and so on. And it's very clear there are big parts of, of social provisioning which wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be uh, produced so if not the state or insurance systems would, uh, would pay for it. It's very clear, it wouldn't happen because it depends very much on the uh, buying power uh, of people, a very basic issue in Keynesian economics. And big part of the buying power people don't have. Novartis has the buy buying power to pay cleaning two, three, four times better than they do it act uh, effectively. But uh, because in Switzerland, if you look at value added, uh, the compensations, salaries, compensation are only 8% of total value added. If you look, if you remember the chart before for the social provisionings branches, it's much higher. It's much higher than 50%, it's 80%, 90% or, or so on. And this is, you wouldn't see it even in, in, the, in the accounting of, in the profits. Uh, of, of pharmaceutical industry if, if they would have paid more. But if you have a hospital, they are under a hell of cost uh, pressure. They have to reduce costs. It's uh, absolutely dysfunctional what they have to do. They don't have the money anymore to pay for, um, for cleaning and they, the cleaning and also the, the preparing of meals in most hospitals is already outsourced. That's really outsourcing the complexity of the work in the hospital itself. And if you are uh, elderly people who need, who don't have a high rent, a big rent, how do, you, how do I pay decently for a cleaning at home? I can't do any more for, uh, uh, I can't do any more, uh, how can I pay 40? francs, which would be more, more or less reasonable, including uh, labor costs, including RVS, uh, nobody can do it. And this is a point, a very important point. And the fourth point is a technological progress hasn't really brought a substantial progress in time saving for households since the 70s. This is a very famous book of, uh, of a guy working on uh, technical progress, a very nice book about the United States in the 20s. It's incredible, uh, the data he has, the story he's, he has about progress. And he says his thesis is that it stopped in the 1970s. And even what's happening with IT effectively, it's not a progress, a big progress for social provisioning or for household work. You can discuss about it. If you know Norwegian as a language, in Norwegian they have made a study exactly about this and they have referred also to this author named Gordon. And um, they say, they ask a question, they have, since the 70s, uh, a lot of uh, state expenditure for um, childcare, for elderly care, for uh, care for ill people, and so on, much, much more than Switzerland. And they ask why, by the hell, do, 
didn't this uh, unpaid work at home didn't really uh, diminish. And I think this is uh, a very important question. And I think we haven't explained it really. You can have all those explanations, but which one is the most convincing? And, and I would like uh, to ask this question for if you want to discuss this in groups of when I have finished. And then the central role of the state and collective insurance scheme in financing person, personal and household related services. And this is really what we have now effects, frightening effects of neoliberalism. And it's really horrible if I look at act at, at current discussions in Switzerland about state finance, it's really, it's horrible. And I don't know how to change in public uh, the opinion that the state shouldn't uh, pay, shouldn't um, finance all those uh, things which are important for women. And uh, I think saving at the cost of the women is really in now again, because of the war after, just after the pandemic, Corona pandemic, it was a bit different now. They have totally changed uh, the public discourse and I'm very, very much uh, worried. And in Economy Feminist, I was this, this uh, organization, association we have created, we are thinking about how could we deal with this and also in public discussions. And to be honest, I don't know how it's so, such a tight public opinion. Next. Now you see uh, how I statistically, I defined uh, the social provisioning. You have on the left of the green line, you have the common um, economic sector and branches, agriculture, sector one, sector two, industry and energy, sec second, uh, sector three, a reduced sector of services. And then I have taken out public administration because for value added, I have to join it. Uh, with uh, social provisioning, I can't, cannot separate it. And then also this could be done, but I don't have time to, it, it, uh, it's just very, uh, uh, it's just a lot of work to work with this, to change, sort out those statistics. Then you have the, at the right hand of this sector, you have social provisioning. And the blue one is the hours worked by men and in millions in Switzerland. And the reddish pinky one is the women's work in, in millions of hours in Switzerland. It's uh, 2016. And then you see agriculture is very bad statistics because uh, peasant women work a lot and it's, it's just, it doesn't work. It's a bad statistic. But in industry, you see uh, women are still the minority. And in the services, you have banks there, you have, you have uh, commerce there, trade and so on. It's a bit more, the share of women. And public administration, it's nearly 50, 50. And all paid and unpaid. A social provision, you have a share of women at at least a, a half of it. And this is all person and household related services. The diverse, the most important is uh, retail trade and restaurants, hotels and so on. You, I have, uh, there are other ones, but, and you can discuss about this X, Usually the other ones take only Y and Z, but X I think has the same economic logic as Y and Z. We can see now the, it, it, in the crisis of, uh, of restaurants, for instance. And Y is just education, health, welfare. 
and the other one is unpaid, they said. And you just see how big, how large this sector is, social provisioning, and how much, uh, how big the share of women is. And this is just to show how I calculate, I do also the calculations of the of, of money and, and ours. This is ours. Next. And this is money and ours. What I did here, I made these sectors, the same sectors and branches as before. And I, I calculated the percentage of value added in total GDP, which is yellow, and the percentage of work of the total of paid and unpaid work in hours. And you see, if you are an economist and you, if you read any article except feminist articles, you read only about the yellow reality, which is an important reality, I don't deny it. And, the, and really the landscape or the horizon of uh, work volume is so much different. And we have, as feminist e economists, we have to live with this and to really work with this uh, different perspective of uh, on the economic uh, economy. The yellow one is about financial flows, except the speculation in the financial sector. It's only part, more, more and more only part. And the, the blue one is, is the time, uh, the time economy. Let's go on. Next, please. And now I have made the same thing what you have already seen in as a, uh, as a, uh, only see as a sector, and these are branches and different sectors. You see here um, on the left side, the total of value added, and as before, uh, the compensations paid. And you see for the sector two industry and sector re uh, services reduced without uh, services, uh, person related services, direct person related services, you see the, the what is yellow, all which is not a uh, cost of salaries uh, is much more or less of the same proportions. What we have here, I have I sorted this out. This is a fire sector, which is discussed now as finance sector, fire means finance, insurance, real estate. They have taken, and I think it makes a lot of sense. The fire sector, you see that the sum, the salaries paid is much less than uh, the yellow part. And this is not the case in the production sector, uh, but in this, in the finance sector, you have a different relationship. And then you have on the other side, of, uh, at the right hand, you have the hosp hospitality, retail sector, public administration, education, I couldn't separate it, health, health, welfare, and then uh, diverse. And you see not hospitality and re related, it's, for, uh, it's linked to um, art and so on. Uh, uh, entertainment industry and so on. And you see, you see once that it's really general that the margin above the, the margin up, uh, of the yellow margin of uh, value added differs a lot. And that's very important. Then I made a, a third research. Next, please. This is once more the same picture, just all sectors, sector one and two and three together. And you, it's just enormous. 
and we don't have a theory of the right part of this of this graphic or only reduce the theory we go on next please and then is the question: uh, Why is it? Why is this social provisioning sector so little capitalist? The accumulation of capital is very small compared to the rest. And um, William Bommel is uh, the one who has really, in the eighties, end of eighties, theorized it, and it's uh, Susan Donat who has uh, taken this up for a feminist economics uh, approach to, to this theory. William Bommel says there is a big difference between work of a person you are a consuming or a good. And this is basic. And also Polanyi, he says, we have to distinguish be between this because, because uh, consuming the work of a person, if you go to a doctor, is something very different to buying uh, shoes. And time economy is different. It is possible to produce cars with less and less input of labor, but accelerating nursing is very difficult without diminishing the, diminishing the service. Progress in labor productivity is not possible in all branches and sectors of work. Uh, William Bommel calls this unbalanced growth. There are sectors who growth, uh, whose growth is very large because they, they have a very high, uh, they have a progress in the productivity of labor calculated in labor costs compared to value added. And so on. And this, I have worked about this, is, this is very short. It has a lot of different aspects. And then the labor decision-making exchange processes are different. I think this is very important and we, know, we need more uh, research about this. And I have taken, I have compiled in this, sorted out in this social provisioning sector, direct person and household related services. The compensations depends on the value added. At long term, you cannot have a restaurant if you, even if you are a cooperative and don't have big salaries, if you cannot uh, uh, cover the costs of production of the meals. And, but uh, the problem of restaurants is that people don't want to spend too much uh, for meals or just uh, for very special restaurants. And this is a permanent uh, problem uh, restaurants have. In the health sector until now on education, if it's not the United States, it's really that the state and, and uh, insurance, uh, insurances uh, provide a lot of the purchasing power for the people, for everybody having access to hospitals. I could never could afford to be in hospital as I'm now with my rent I have, my income I have, if I were in the United States, for instance. And so you have uh, the question, which is very important in the, a total discussion about social provisioning, who needs care services and who is able to pay for it. The value added depends on the pur purchasing power. I, the, the Novartis or pharmaceutical industry is really uh, very clear. The compensation depends on the value added. On the value added depends on the purchasing power. What prices you get, you can sell the whole thing. Next. I have made uh, also, I have tried to compare older times. Uh, I just want to show you one thing. I think we should research uh, much more. I have taken the median income levels, gross salary, which is used for, for the page, uh, 
gender pay gap. And then I have uh, looked at a full-time equivalent of women and men in those uh, in those uh, because you have both data and then I have compa compiled it in four levels of median income. M1 M1 is the lowest, M2 is uh, the lower up to middle class, M3 is upper middle class, M3 is uh, M4, this is a mistake, is much, it's just a lot of income. And then I have separated how many uh, jobs, full-time equivalent uh, are, uh, I have uh, looked at full-time equivalent in branches and uh, the income, median income levels of men and women in those branches. So in industry, you have at the left, the women are the only one who do work in the industry uh, uh, with, uh, in, a bra in branches with the lowest median income levels. And then you see M2, you see a lot of jobs for men uh, in, uh, with a, a second lower middle, middle income and below. Uh, a lot of jobs for men, not so many for women. Then you have better paid job, jobs for men, quite a lot. And women, you have, it's the only one, only sector, only branch where women have a median income level is uh, the pharmaceutical industry. In all other industries, it's only men who belong to this very big uh, sector with very high median income levels. You can look at it at services and you see men are, there are many men, uh, many jobs for men with very, very high salaries. And you have medium women and work in services uh, in the middle, lower and middle upper class level. And then, the person and household related services only which are paid, you see a, a very different distribution. So we, if you calculate the gender pay gap, this underlying distribution of, uh, of structure, distribution of salaries and in different branches is very important. And I don't think honestly that you can really discuss about uh, a gender pay gap if you don't look at those differences. I have done about this quite some other researches, but this would be a very, very interest, interesting uh, statistical research if you look for, uh, for something to, to do a seminar or master work or anything. Next, please. I personally came to the conclusion uh, that we need much more financing of time intensive work. And that this is also very important from an ecological point of view. Just imagine how much more work you have to do in agriculture if you really want to have a very, uh, a, uh, a very organic production in agriculture. You have the same thing already for childcare, for uh, in, in healthcare, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this work doesn't disappear. And the more you have uh, very uh, productive work in, in the industry or banking sector and so on, the more in this sector, high salaries can be paid and the, the price relations, the cost relations change enormously. And this we have to analyze. I tried to do it in this article you got, uh, I, I sent to you. And my question of the future, which I think is a very basic question, uh, also from an ecological point of view, 
how does a society organize decent conditions for labor intensive work, which provides basic person and household related services to everybody? You can also say which provides provides basic <coughs> basic work for the for a ecological production in agriculture and so on. Which organizational criteria criteria to uh, do we need to ensure that the work is done and appropriately paid? How does a society organize this? We have a very bad organization actually for a lot of work uh, has been done in very bad conditions. And there I would really like to raise one issue of theory. There is a basic difference between financing investment and financing work. And I think sometimes if you speak investment in care and so on, what, what do you speak about? About work, which has to be financed every day and every year, or do you speak about infrastructure of care, of care which is um, financing new hospitals or better uh, crashes, or I don't know what. I think this distinction very often is very much blurred. Very, um, the, the work, the word investment is used in a way uh, which is very nice. I, which sounds very good and very uh, future oriented, but I'm not so sure if it's really a good idea. And. And how does the society organize decent conditions for labor intensive work in future, essentially for a, 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 a in future essential for an ecologically sustainable economy? And I think this is only possible if much more money is allocated. The question is how to organize it. And I have listed once more and bitte uh, machen. I have listed once more. Uh, the possibilities I have, I came across. One is increase of public ex expenditure for labor intensive work, organizes public work, I would say the extension of Sweden. Then an extension of state subsidies to privately organized producers. We have this in a big scale for agriculture. It could be, be done better. In Belgium, they do it for uh, clean cleaning work in households. Uh, to uh, with the same objective that that people who really need it uh, can pay uh, 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 can pay for it and that those who do it get a decent uh, uh, a decent salary for it. Then basic income there the imagination is that you just freeze the time of people to do the work in 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 a lot of work in social provisioning. I'm for macroeconomic reasons, not so much, not convinced, less and less. And then Federici, salary for house, family work, and other unpaid activities. And then job guarantee for the care for the environment, the commute, community and the people, as Paulina Cerneva is uh, propagating more and more. And if you look at this, this fine, we need much more finance for this. Of course, you can, can have some of the finances by tax uh, regulations, but at the biggest part is not possible to, to organize by taxes. Then how? Then you need uh, a different monetary theory. And this is the other big, theoretical elephant lurking outside the door, the monetary theory of finance product. So I have finished and I have to leave. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. That was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So I regret very much to not be being able to hear your discussion. And, but anyway, somehow I will be informed about it.
But I'm very, very pleased that such groups as pluralist economists uh, exist, or, or students of plural economy exist. It's real, really a very, pro, uh, a very time-intensive work, but a big progress. Thank you very much. <laughs>